Hello, welcome to The Learning Playlist, a podcast for the major and general education courses under the tutelage of Mr. Ryan Dave Ryla, USJR College Instructor. This project is a supplement to the set courses and as a means to share knowledge to the public at large. To help the podcast grow, kindly follow us at facebook.com slash The Learning Playlist. And now, on to our show. Hello and welcome to the introduction, introductory lecture for the class no, for, um, for PS Elect 4, which is Modern Political Theory. Now, let's start off with a context, a bit of a context for this, um, for this lecture. As you can see in the background before you right now, we have for our future in this lecture we have the first quarter storm which occurred around january 26 uh, until um early february um during 19 during 1970 so it's quite an interesting um it's quite an interesting story behind this um so called first quarter storm or sigwa as many circles would call it um it was a time when Filipinos, largely from all walks of, of life, but um, primarily primarily led by students, um, went out of their went out of their way to actually protest something and to not only protest in um, in in few isolated groups, but in their tens of thousands. No, and Sigwa or what we remember today in its um fiftieth year anniversary as the first quarter storm, is um is memorialized in philippine society in many ways some would even call it as a riot as you can see in the background no? a newspaper call it riots other others call it as um, a just protest against a tyrannical regime um, you have to you have to um, remember your history that it happened before martial law was declared and at that time many social issues were rage, were raging in the philippines but since this is a political theory class i think it's best that we um we start our introspection of the topic of modern and contemporary political theory with this um why do people why do people protest for example or perhaps we can ask why do people insist on their right and on their involvement in governance this is a key question that i wish to um that I wish to explore with the class throughout this semester. Why do people have involvement in power? And has this always been the case? So, in asking this question, we are not only um, talking about what happened 50 years ago during the first quarter storm in the Philippines, but rather let's put this, um, let's put these questions in, in the forefront of our lives today. Why do we need to study political theory? And how does political theory inform us about um, why people go out and go out of their way and protest, for example, or why do they even insist on their rights as they perceive it? Okay, so proceeding now to the lecture. Um, let's talk about the basics or let's talk about a form of an overview no the course overview for this um, introductory lecture modern and contemporary political theory okay so the past 500 years has rather been interesting for not only for filipinos but for everyone in the sense that the 500 the past 500 years have been referred to not only by scholars but by um, people from all walks of life as the modern times and we will talk a bit about modernity later but for the past 500 years it seems that there has been a steady progress as to um not only as to not only the standard of living that ordinary people have come have become accustomed to 
especially in the past 200 years, but also um, in terms of how far politics has transformed in those uh, in in that time period no, of 500 years. So we begin, for example, with the Renaissance in Europe, which is um, the revival of interests in the arts and the sciences that was handed down from the from ancient antiquity, no, or from sorry, not ancient antiquity, but from classical antiquity, from the Greeks and the Romans and those who came before them. So many of those interests uh, or many of those knowledge have been lost for for a good part of the medieval era, which lasted from around. Um, 500s AD after the fall of Rome up until the 1500s and as you can see um, the Renaissance of the mid 1400s up until the 1600s um, gradually created not only interest but also more and more um, more and more focus renewed focus on what we now know today as anthropocentrism no, or the centrality of man as a point of inquiry as um, as the object of inquiry in this world so um, this revival of interest is also brought about by geopolitical changes in the sense that the fall of constantinople in 1453 actually um, created uh, not only a flood of Im a flood of immigrants, no, of refugees from the fallen empire, but also it created um, it created a diaspora of culture that was um, bringing with it ancient knowledge from Greece and Rome, the two leading civilizations of the past that um, people continue to look up to as um, as golden ages or as standards for the ages, and as well as um as well as as well as geopolitical changes in terms of the fall of constantinople another major change was the discovery of the americas so the the late 1400s was quite interesting for our modern times in the sense that um europeans since this subject is largely based on the european canon no? on the on the primary um text coming from europe since and it's the recommended material that we use. Um, the discovery of the Americas also created um, trends, and not only trends, but paradigms or frameworks that are still with us today, and those will be explored um, around the midterms to the final term of this course. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, going into the 1500s, and um, the 1600s, we see the rise of nation states, states like um, Britain, or the United Kingdom, um, Spain, France, Russia, and many others. Again, this is a very Western approach um, in our political theory in this subject. No, so um, those states will come again; they will recur time and again. They will be mentioned, but um, let's not talk much about their geopolitics as. Um, as of this time we will we will catch up with those later however what we need to know for now in the 1500s and the 1600s is that um, the age of exploration um, provided impetus by the discovery of the americas and with with um, the voyages around the world especially after 1521 no, with the return of um, what remained of magellan's crew proving that the world can be circumnavigated um, this time period of about a hundred years is also very influential in the development of political theory and of course in the develop in the political development of Europe, Western Europe at that time, in the sense that um, it was the, an age where a rising sense of nationalism, not simply of um, not simply of uh, what do you call this of the creation of powerful kingdoms. But also, there was competition between Europeans, not only political and military competition, but also economic and, in some degrees, um, intellectual competition. And it created major, major um, frameworks, and it also created trends that continue to have an effect on us, especially in the first 
uh, especially when we talk about the first wave of colonization. Like in the Philippines, we have uh, the 500 centennial of um, Christianity here in the Philippines, no? which is also, um, we, we, we not only hearken back to the coming of Christianity of the Philippines, but also um, the coming of colonization and many others. Also, there's ref the reformation of Martin Luther and his Protestant movement, no? the, the movement that came with his, um, with, his, with his actions that also triggered a major European cataclysm or event, which is the Thirty Years' War. Uh, in the sense, this period of um, the modern era, the 15 to the 1600s, um, set much of the stage for the later uh, for the later periods and at the same time this was also a, a, an age or this was also um, a time where massive changes not only in warfare developed but also in politics we see the rise for example of more powerful monarchs like Philip II of Spain Philip II of Spain and um, many others who created centralized governments whose powers are now um, more felt by its citizens than ever no? and they can they have created governments that are not only strong but governments that have um, more say in the in the daily affairs of their citizens and we will come back um, on that one later as we discuss power um, with Machiavelli's work on the prince as for the 1700s and the 1800s the creation of these centralized states and uh, and the uh, consolidation of power behind monarchs even advanced further but something occurred in the at the end of the 1700s so at the turn near at the turn of the century um, into the 1800s wherein um, the French Revolution happened and not only was the um, was the French Revolution very very important in our in our subject but it's also very important in world affairs in the sense that the french revolution and its effects are still with us today so the call for liberty equality and fraternity still echo with us in different packages in the form let's say for example in the present time in the form of um, black lives matters movement and many other rights movement not only coming from um, traditional gender roles of men and women but also in the form of um, let's say animal rights and many others as we call it uh, new politics and so the 17 in the 1800s um, not only they uh, not only was it a period known for its scientific advancements and the creation of more liberal ideas that gave way to or that eventually blossomed into the French Revolution and before that the American Revolution in which um, these revolutions succeeded in in not only overthrowing old norms that are arguably still medieval in nature in nature for example the french revolution um overthrew the asian regime no the old regime of um the monarchs of france which are considered as um in many ways as divine monarchs if you remember for example one of their kings mentioned that um le estat moi or i am the state and so um, absolutism or the concentration of power um, in the hands of, of an absolute monarch was effectively challenged in this time. And the French Revolution continues to be a shining light in our, in our, day, uh, in our contemporary days, in our modern times, as a, sort of a, as a sort of an ideal. Although we do know that the French Revolution um, eventually ended and gave way to another form of tyranny under Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, there were many changes in the in the time period of the 1700s and the 1800s, not only the French Revolution, which um, introduced, arguably, some concepts of human rights, but also we see competing ideologies like um, the creation of Marxism and communism, and of course, in the wake of that, many independence movements um, in, during the 1800s, like for example, the Greek independence movement, and uh, of course, the Filipino independence movement, no? the Philippine independence movement as one of the first in Asia, and they were, um, let's say, 
tapping into enlightenment ideas and liberal ideas that they got from Europe. Okay. On to the 1900s, we see more rapid and more rapid social and political changes in the in the sense that industrialization by this time by the 1900s the past 100 years has um, has truly changed uh, the way that we live as human beings from the product from the mass production of goods to um, let's say the rise of the consumerist society in the past 100 years alone um, more more products are now available and not only more products are available but also um, in a tragic twist of fate, more means for killing one another also became widely available. And this led, for example, in the first decade of, well, in the second decade of the 1900s, the, the 1910s, it led to um, the tragedy of the First World War, which is called um, by many as the seminal tragedy, the, the war that set the context of our time today. Um, and World War One and its many effects continue to continue to um, be with us to, or continues to be with us today. Um, um, it also gave rise to competing ideologies that are still with us and are that continue to affect um, the way we think about politics, like socialism and fascism, which are at the opposite ends of the political spectrum. And then we have the rise of totalitarian ideologies, um, commonly found also in both sides of socialism and fascism, um, taken to the extreme by uh, by very few, no. And many of these and their attempts have been quite successful in the past. You have leaders like Stalin, um, Mao Zedong, and then of course Hitler. So totalitarianism or the subordination of of all human life, all human activity under the state, uh, became a uh, became a major political ideology, and not only political ide ideology, but um, a major reality in our world in the past one hundred years. Then there's the Second World War, which is far worse than the First World War. No, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail on that. I think that's already implied. The Cold War again was. Um, or the Cold War is also um, a major, a major contributor to our understanding of our, of the world today, of our world today as millennials and Gen Z. And then uh, there's the rise of new politics, where politics is not just a concern of of states, but individuals now have greater input into politics. Say, for example, um, interest groups have cropped up over the past one hundred years to fight for for rights of individuals no not only were there women's group at the beginning of the 1900s and even until today first they fought for the right to the right to vote no the suffragette movement especially in the united states um wherein they won um the women's right to vote but also there were other there were other movements involved in this time you have animal rights movement, gay rights movement, and um, many other many other interest groups that have come to that have come to dominate the political life of society as we know it today. Then there's also the postmodernism um, approach into deconstruction and um, how things ought to be viewed. No, um, I will not go into detail about postmodernism as I do not have the authority to speak about it at length. So let's proceed now to the present day, wherein we have the politics of dignity as found in the most recent example of the Black Lives Matter movement and many other um, mov movements similar to that in the past, let's say, half decade. The Me Too movement can be considered as part of the politics of dignity and many other movements that continue to to not only draw inspiration from the past 500 years and the trends that we have just recently talked about, but also they continue to draw inspiration from, um, from modern day issues that needs to be resolved and needs to be talked about. And as well as um, the politics of dignity, there's also the biggest issue of our time, climate change. 
wherein um, not only scientists are involved, but ordinary people like you and me are involved as well. So let's proceed. Okay, so when we talk about modernity as a central concept for this course, um, there is no set definition actually of modernity. However, um, I'd like to argue that um, modernity, as long um, as long as it has been used, but not only by scholars but by ordinary people as well, modernity has been equated with progress, um, the kind of progress that is anti, that is um, that is opposite, no, antithetical to to um, to medieval ideas about um, how women and men uh, behave how um how the world should be viewed etc so when we say modern modernity or when we talk about modernity i think it's best that we that we have a common ground for this class and that is modernity uh, means progress but um again there is no set definition actually okay so um in the arts for example modernity has been largely associated with the creation of new artistic impressions and um, new social political ideas that best reflects the emerging industrialization of the world and of course um, it's not only industrialization but the focus on the well-being of human beings is um, is a central theme of modernity however modernity as an idea did not go unanswered from different sectors of society most notably the roman catholic church also had um, its own um, say and its own stance about what what is perceived to be as modernity so again since this is not clearly defined aside from um, what we've just talked about then um, modernity has many meanings for different people and for different sectors of the of the uh, different sectors of society so why are we talking about modernity why should modernity be the central focus of a subject or of a course no under the degree program of political science well the ideas of today the ideas that we talk about not only about law for example but the philosophies behind many of the laws many of the social programs and social issues that we are facing on a daily basis they are heavily shaped by the norms the worldviews and the technologies of modernity so modernity as an idea is not something that we should ignore it's not even something that we should um, well it is something that we should trifle with or we should tinker with uh, because these ideas repackaged as they are especially since these build upon the older ideas from the time of the greeks and the romans these ideas continue to uh, not only continue to evolve but they continue to have relevance in our lives in the sense that um, introspecting modernity is uh, like unpacking no unpacking a bundle or unboxing <laughs> to use a more modern term uh, for the first time as to what we are getting out of our modern lives okay so exploring modernity is like unboxing we are unboxing the, the very contents of our lives and in a sense trying to make sense of what just came out of the box of the box that is called reality so asking about modernity perhaps we can think about um where it came from and who to whom does it apply to is it solely for example um a western idea can we say um, that only the west is modern and the rest um, let's say for us asians are we not modern are we not modern like um let's say or do we always have to compare ourselves with the west with, with europeans and americans um is modernity equated with westernization does it mean that we cannot be modern in our own way simply because we are not western enough no and this has serious implications into our worldview for example in india 
there has been a common um well a common stereotype or assumption that if you are not um pale enough in complexion you will never become a modern uh, let's say a modern actor or actress in the TVs and increasingly in the internet no and i think we also have that here in the philippines where in um standards of beauty tend to be quote and quote western and my last question would be who can be considered as modern can asians be considered as modern or can we only be considered modern if we adapt the the let's say the trappings of modernity as as um as implied by by the west no? should should modernity only be um or should the trendsetters of modernity only be western and not otherwise no so this is a very important question as well for us as we explore um the key dynamic in this course in modern and contemporary political theory which is about power in the modern in the modern world what is power how do we see power no, because this this is also very reflective of recent developments in our time especially um if you have heard uh, for example what what the U, the currently elected US president Joe Biden the 46th president of the United States right now um especially in what he said in um in his inauguration speech no, we lead not by the example of our power but by the power of our example so perhaps we can even apply what he said in in the, our questions of modernity whose example should be viewed as modern no? or can any can everyone become modern so that's something that we need to further explore in the in the course of this of this um of this subject now i cannot i cannot offer you definitive answers as again i am not an authority on that one however i can encourage you to journey with me in this um in this in this subject or in this course uh, for the semester and as well as those questions that uh, that i have posted there are also many frameworks that we need to tackle um, anthropocentrism, secularism, liberalism, communism, fascism, socialism, and communitarianism, communitarianism, and many more. We shall explore throughout the throughout this course. But then again, we all begin with the main framework: modernity. What does it mean to be modern? And should modernity only be defined by the West? I'm intrigued by by um by modernity or and because of that I included it in this course um although it's all only implied in the main material that we are using no? um, we are using um the 2002 book from um Ebenstein and Ebenstein William Ebenstein and his son of course um we're using the great the great political thinkers from Plato to the present day and so um, this book its canon or its uh, main main source is largely largely from the Western world largely from America and Europe but then again we're not European I'm not European I'm Asian and therefore I also bring my own um, perspective into the into the teaching of this course and I would like to bring it closer still especially to my students to you so that you may um, you may feel that we're not just learning a foreign subject but we're also um, learning a subject that is not only relevant for us but also um, perhaps we're what I'm trying to say to you is that um, we're learning this very Western approach uh, Western focus subject and we're trying to bring it down or not bring it down per, per se I'm, I'm mincing my words here but we're trying to um, bring it into our own perspective as Asians no? as as people of of a different culture 
and we try to ask it. Now, I did say in the first meeting that um, we should minimize bringing in our personal biases into this course, but I cannot seem to help to notice that if we're going to study this course exclusively from a Western point of view, then we are also alienating ourselves. We are not Western, mind you. We can put ourselves in their shoes, but ultimately, we cannot um, we cannot take off our own mindsets. No, we cannot um, we cannot um, we cannot step out of ourselves per se. And so, um, I'm encouraging you to think about it not simply um, not simply by imbibing all the ideas that we came that we come across, but also asking those. Uh, uh, asking questions as it is relevant to us, especially from our own unique perspective as people of today, as Asians. So, in that regard, I think we have we have to end our lecture for today on on that note as to um, as to what political theory should be. And, well, not just as to what political theory should be, but how should we approach political theory? Um, in the sense, uh, I'm being clean here, I'm being um, quite candid here in talking to you, my students, as to, um, as to what I think about it. But, um, but perhaps more importantly, um, I would like to, I would like to, I would just like to say to everyone that um, studying political theory and teaching it has its own has its own um, how do you, how would I say this has its own perks and has its own um, questions that always bother me. No, so I, I I have to be honest with you. I have more questions than answers, but uh, but rest assured that those questions are are going to be explored with you. And I would welcome any input from you um, throughout this course. And with that, thank you for listening to thank you for listening uh, to the subject to PSLEC four. And I hope you also subscribe to my channel for further content. And I'll see you on the next one. Goodbye.